सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली Inflation as measured by the consumer price index in November has come in below 6% for the first time this year since January and inflation as measured by the wholesale price index has come in below 6% for the first time since March 2021 Now there are a lot of questions to be asked about this what do the CPI and the WPI measure does a national data on inflation reflect what's happening in the states does it reflect what's happening in your markets that's what we're going to look at in this episode of macro sutra i'm tca sharad raghavan economy editor at the print and we have with us radhika pande as always noted economist and consultant at nipfp thank you so much for joining us thank you so now radhika at the outset what is the key difference between cpi and wpi what are the baskets that each look at how are they different so uh, these are the two measures uh, to assess inflation in the country one is the consumer price index which measures prices at the retail level so at the final consumer level the prices are measured with the help of consumer price index and wholesale price index measures prices at the wholesale level so at the producer level now the difference also lies in the coverage of items the basket that is included the basket of goods the weightage of those commodities in the wholesale price index and in the cpi so there are notable differences uh, one difference is that uh, food occupies a big chunk in the cpi so in the cpi almost half of uh, the consumer price index is accounted for by food food and beverages uh, whereas in uh, wholesale price index the uh, big chunk is accounted for by manufactured products manufactured products accounts for almost 64% of the overall wholesale price index food uh, weightage is less and it's uh, primarily part of something called primary articles so that is that is where food is also uh, uh, covered the other di- notable difference is that in cpi we include services whereas uh, wpi does not cover services it uh, primarily focuses on uh, manufactured uh, goods services like education medical uh, services health recreation all these things are accounted for by in cpi and not in wpi uh, so so these are some of the uh, differences and the so as i mentioned the commodity composition is different and even if there are common items their weightage is uh, different uh, who is measuring them who is releasing the data is also different for example cpi is released by the ministry of statistics and program implementation mosp whereas wpi is released by office of economic advisor in the under the ministry of commerce Right and so now for a typical household it, every month the CPI and WPI data comes out for a typical household should they be more concerned with the CPI data or the WPI because the different weightages yeah. are such so so uh, for a typical household they have to be more they are more closer to cpi because the uh, cpi weights are also determined on the basis of their consumption expenditure mm-hmm. so the national sample survey organization conducts uh, what is called the consumer expenditure survey ces which is uh, which is supposed to be conducted every 5 years uh, there was one ces which was conducted in 2017 18 but it was not released uh, in the public domain so right now the latest consumer expenditure survey that we have is for uh, 2011 12 uh, so the per capita consumption expenditure based on that the weights are determined under cpi so for a typical household it's the cpi that matters more and therefore even 
even under the inflation targeting framework, the the nominal anchor or the target is based on uh, CPI. Right. You know, WPI for from for policy perspective, WPI is uh, capturing more of tradable goods. You know, things like metals, which are our main uh, tradable items, chemicals. So whenever there are changes in the international markets, first those changes are captured in WPI and then they transmit to CPI. So that is the policy uh, uh, you know, uh, purpose of wholesale price index. Okay. And now because the WPI and CPI, number one, they're looking at different items in the basket and the weightages are also different. It's not necessary that they will move in tandem. It's not necessary that they will move in tandem. There are uh, <clears throat> episodes where they move in tandem. There are episodes where they completely diverge, diverge, particularly in episodes where food inflation is very high. Those are the instances where CPI and WPI diverge because if food inflation is high, that will show up more in CPI rather than in WPI. Also, if the, the services inflation is high, then again, we will see uh, divergence between CPI and WPI. So those are because their uh, weightage and commodity composition is different, representativeness is different. There are instances of uh, divergence, but there are also instances where they move in tandem. If the the common items are moving in tandem and if there is a transmission pass through from international prices to retail prices then they tend to move in tandem so that's likely to happen say if there are high oil prices yes. abroad then that tr transmits to the domestic market in yes. terms of all your manufactured goods yes. it can affect food prices as well yes. Yes, so that's what I said. The external shocks get transmitted to WPI and then from WPI with a lag to CPI. So those are the those are that is the transmission mechanism. And you mentioned that uh, the monetary policy, the framework, inflation targeting, it looks at CPI. Yeah. So now that CPI has come below six percent, now this is a question that we got from the audience as well. Yeah. Now that it is below six percent, can we expect the RBI to go easier on rate cuts? And also, what does this lower inflation? What does it mean for the Q3 GDP data? Okay, so. CPI has come uh, below 6%, 5.9, 5.88% to be precise. Uh, but that is primarily due to vegetable prices, you know. So uh, within CPI, the food inflation came down and food inflation also came down due to a contraction in vegetable prices. Now, vegetable prices are uh, seasonal in nature. Now we have the uh, uh, entry of onset of uh, vegetable uh, winter vegetable crops in the market. Therefore, supply has increased and prices have come down. So this is a seasonal phenomenon. Typically, in these winter months, we see vegetable prices cooling down. But if we look at the other components of uh, inflation, even if we look at food inflation, the cereal prices are still very high. And in fact, they have risen from October to November. We have seen an uptick in cereal prices. Another uh, area of concern uh, is uh, milk prices. Milk prices remain elevated. Even spices. Now, that's a new thing. I mean, that is something whose weight is very small. But if we look at the spices inflation, it's almost 20 percent. Oh, wow. So uh, cumin on all these uh, masalas and spices, their prices have uh, inched up. So there are a combination of factors, but because their weight, weightage in the overall CPI basket is small, they don't get reflected in the overall CPI number. Uh, that is number one. And second, the core inflation, which the RBI's monetary policy uh, statement also spoke about and we discussed in one of our episodes, the core inflation continues to remain sticky. Core inflation, which is, you know, stripping out of uh, our, if we uh, exclude food and fuel, uh, it's still elevated and it has again also risen. So the trajectory, it's still the year on year change has uh, increased uh, from October to November. So going by these uh, uh, key trends, though we have seen that RBI has reduced the quantum of rate hike uh, from 50 basis points to 35 basis points, uh, we see that uh, rate hiking cycle is, has not ended. Uh, for sure. There will be moderate rate hikes and then going forward there will be uh, a pause. RBI would like to s assess the impact of uh, its rate hikes on demand but at least there would be one more uh, episode of rate hike before pausing. 
So now you explained a little bit about uh, how inflation, when you dig deeper, there's a variation between vegetables and cereals and others. So again, coming back to our typical household, mm -hmm. what should they expect from this data that the veggie prices are going to be lower this month yes. than earlier? But other things in your kitchen might become even more expensive than they were. So cereal prices and uh, again cereal, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, uh, weights also, uh, particularly for a rural household, if cereal prices remain elevated, that is a cause of concern because in their consumption baskets, cereals occupy a significant uh, place. They have a significant weight within the food uh, basket. So if cereal prices remain elevated, that is a cause of concern for households and that will pinch the rural households uh, more. And uh, till we have the rubby crop coming, hitting the market, say in the month of March, we should uh, see uh, cereal prices remaining elevated, particularly due to wheat and rice. We've seen, we've discussed the various reasons for why wheat prices and rice uh, prices uh, are elevated. And that is reflected in the stock. The public stock of uh, wheat and rice is uh, six year low uh, because of uh, earlier uh, climatic conditions adversely impacting wheat crop, then procurement not happening because uh, farmers selling to traders. So all these factors resulted in supply constraint and therefore at least for two, three months more cereal prices are likely to remain elevated. Okay. And so that's food inflation. Now, how should a household read core inflation that you talked about? Does core inflation affect them at all? And if so, how? Yeah, so core inflation, particularly if we look at, there is one component in CPI, which is miscellaneous, mm -hmm. uh, which includes uh, items like household goods and services, personal care and effects. Uh, so the communication, all these uh, are part of your core inflation. And uh, what we've talked about earlier also, that there is a transmission happening from uh, input costs to uh, final output prices. Right. Uh, and that transmission is still not complete though input prices are, have started to moderate now as we've seen in the uh, commodity uh, prices easing but that transmission is still not complete and because the demand is uh, strong particularly in urban areas so uh, companies are in a position to uh, transmit the input costs to output prices and therefore the co uh, core inflation is elevated. Which basically means that these companies can pass on price rises to the people and the people, since they have a demand, they will pay the higher price. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And now coming to the national data versus what's happening in the states yes. and whether the national data can speak for the entire country or is it that, you know, inflation in Jammu Kashmir is very different from Kerala inflation in Gujarat is very different from, say, Meg Meghalaya. Is there a disparity across the country? Yes. So when we talk about this number, when we say CPI inflation is 5.88, mm -hmm. it's actually a weighted average of all the states. Okay. okay. So all the states have a weight. And within state also the rural, for example, say uh, Haryana, uh, they will have, uh, Haryana will have a weight. Maharashtra has a weight. So they have a weight and that weight is again determined by both rural as well as urban uh, regions within Maharashtra. Uh, so typically uh, what happens is that based on the per capita consumption pattern, per capita consumption expenditure, weights are assigned in the rural areas and in the urban areas. Now, since these rural areas, then they are distributed amongst the states. If some rural area is part of Punjab, then that weight becomes part of Punjab. If it is in Haryana, that becomes part of Haryana. So that is how the weights are determined based on the per capita consumption expenditure and which is again based on a survey, as I mentioned, the consumer expenditure survey. So consumers are asked. Sorry. And this was uh, 
now the data that we have for this survey is from 2011 as you mentioned yes. so it might be significantly dated it might not Absolutely. be representative of what's happening right now Absolutely that uh, there is time to uh, you know review the weights based on the survey and because the survey of 2017 was not uh, incorporated there is time to you know update the survey do the survey and uh, revise the weights based on the present consumption pattern uh, because in the CPI as uh, we know there are six components there is food and beverages there is fuel and light uh, there is clothing and footwear pan tobacco miscellaneous so consumers are asked how much you are spending on food right. how much you are spending on clothing so and again for each component there is a duration you are asked how much you have spent over the last 7 days for some items you are asked how much you have spent over the last one month so based on all these assessments weights are assigned now consumers in uh, rural bihar would would have a different spending pattern from a consumer in urban maharashtra so the weights are based on the consumption uh, patterns so these are how the, this is how the weights are determined mm -hmm. and then uh, so one is the weights and then the prices yeah. prices are determined by again uh, going to the markets so uh, every month there there is a pre de there are pre uh, designated set of markets in rural areas and urban areas around uh, 1180 markets in urban areas and 1100 plus markets in rural areas and then they are asked okay what quotation for each price for each commodity is taken so okay. and then they are multiplied to get the index so okay. this is how the weights are done so now even within a state uh, you had mentioned that there are discrepancies yes. and a uh, huge difference in rural inflation and urban inflation for the same commodity for the same commodity yes so for so one reason for that is the markets are different mm -hmm. the other reason is that the weight is different now weight is different for example as i mentioned Maharashtra the rural weight is different rural maharashtra weight is different from an urban maharashtra weight because the consumption pattern is uh, different right. uh, so the weights are different and the prices can also be different and that is reflected in your uh, in the, our state's uh, data uh, for 22 states that we have analyzed uh, what we see is that out of 22 states for 16 states the rural inflation is higher than the urban right. inflation Now you've mentioned that there is a lot of discrepancy between the states in terms of their inflation rates. So, which are the states that you're seeing have higher inflation than the national average, and which are the ones that are doing better? So, uh, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, and uh, uh, Haryana. These are the four states that whose inflation is uh, above six percent. Uh, Telangana has the highest inflation, and Telangana has been having the highest uh, inflation over the last few months. The good, uh, encouraging point is that. Uh, inflation in telangana has uh, moderated as compared to the october number mm -hmm. but it is still high uh, it is 7.9% that is the cpi inflation wow. in telangana okay. as compared to the national average which is 5.9 mm -hmm. so it is 7.8% now again uh, states like andhra pradesh maharashtra haryana their inflation is almost around 7% you know 6.8 6.7 and so on mm -hmm. again in telangana moderation has happened due to uh, food inflation again due to food inflation food inflation has come down due to vegetable prices contraction but cereals and spices are inflation is very high and again rural cereal inflation rural spices inflation are very high so that is the a uh, point about uh, telangana mm -hmm. the states which have uh, low inflation that is you know around 4% or even below 4% uh, delhi himachal pradesh and chatisgarh these mm -hmm. are the states which have uh, low inflation delhi has uh, around 2 2.5% inflation uh, chatisgarh and himachal pradesh have uh, 4% inflation mm -hmm. so that is the, uh, the in terms of ranking what we can see uh, but in telangana again while the food inflation has come down the core inflation is still very high it is almost 10% 
Wow. The miscellaneous uh, inflation that we uh, refer to, it is still 10%. So that is again a cause of concern. So while food inflation has come down, the core inflation measured by miscellaneous inflation has remained high. But so how is it that these states with the low inflation, how is Delhi managing to have such low inflation in some yeah, of the that other? Is, that is something that, you know, we, it's, a, it's a puzzle why there is so much uh, deviation uh, difference between Delhi, Himachal Pradesh, Telangana. For, to some extent, it depends on uh, whether some uh, freebies are being given in uh, some state. It is linked to their uh, fiscal performance. So there are a number of factors and it's very hard to give uh, a concrete answer on why one state is faring better than the other. But at least one step that we can do is to look at the, the constituents or the drivers of inflation in at least the very high inflation states mm -hmm. and see what are the reasons and whether those uh, reasons are still remaining the same. Why this is important is because as, as we mentioned that, you know, this number is a weighted average and all the states are, they have a weight. Now, Maharashtra has the highest weight. Maharashtra okay. and Uttar Pradesh, these are the two states that have the highest weights derived from the consumer expenditure survey. So if Maharashtra has a high inflation, that will get reflected in uh, the national inflation number also to a, larger to a larger extent as compared to Telangana, whose weight is just three and a half percent. Okay. So these are the, the you know insights that state inflation is important, particularly those states which feature uh, whose weight in the overall inflation derived from consumer expenditure survey is higher. Okay, and now coming to a little bit about the sectors of the economy, we have a question from the audience which looks at uh, what he calls the cow economy. So he says the the increase in fodder prices has an inflationary effect on the cow economy. What are the government's efforts to cope with this situation? So this is again a very uh, specific uh, factor that we are seeing milk inflation being above 8% and it has remained uh, it has remained elevated. We have seen instances where mother dairy they have hiked prices of uh, milk, full cream milk, toned milk and so on. And the main reason for this is that the fodder uh, prices have risen. The feed cost and fodder prices have risen. And because these are the input costs uh, towards milk production, they constitute almost 60 to 70% of the milk production cost. So if they rise, for fodder, meaning if the prices of say maize is rising, mm -hmm. uh, that will have a bearing on uh, milk production cost and therefore the milk production uh, will be hampered and supply will be impacted and prices would have to be uh, raised. So it's very important to look at this entire dynamics of prices in uh, prices of fodder. What's, what is the cropping pattern? And uh, the question is very relevant because now we have the budget coming up. Is there a need to provide policy support to fodder uh, as part of the animal husbandry initiatives that are taken uh, every year as part of the uh, budget? There may be a, a need for that because this time around uh, the fodder crop has been impacted due to adverse weather changes. And so you know, we have uh, instances where there is surplus of fodder and then we have deficit. So there may be in, uh, need for setting up of fodder banks or some kind of policy support from NABAD and other uh, initiatives to help uh, fodder uh, uh, support and also to incentivize fodder production because uh, it's a very small proportion of the overall uh, production, the land that is uh, allocated to fodder. So maybe there is a need to that, towards that and uh, there is scope for providing policy support in the budget. Absolutely, because farmers are getting support in the form of a fertilizer subsidy. The government is not passing on the rising fertilizer prices. So something like this maybe can be done for fodder as well. Yes, particularly now because uh, it's showing up in inflation mm -hmm. uh, that milk inflation, egg fish meat, meat inflation has been elevated due to uh, shortage of fodder or due to uh, spoiling of crops. So there is need to look into that direction also. It's a very specific component, but it has a bearing on overall food inflation. Right. And now it's not that you know global oil pr oil prices are affecting this. this is a purely domestic thing that yes. the government can address yes 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 okay and so now this is kind of a, a two-part question if yeah. the if the 
survey on which the consumption patterns are estimated yeah. is so dated yeah. it's more than a decade old yeah. and if there is a lot of uh, variation across the inflation in states right. and if within the states also there is a, a variation between urban and rural yes. then what does the average person take away from the inflation number what does it tell us that is why it's very important to not only look at the uh, national figure but also look at uh, state level uh, variations and also again within the state look at are there wide dis differences between rural and urban uh, uh, state so as I, as we discussed so one one reason could be the weight right. but the weights are fixed okay once the weight is fixed from 2011 12 consumer expenditure survey the weights are fixed but Correct. that weight is different for rural and urban uh, area so that is the weightage which is based on consumption pattern but the prices uh, can differ and uh, the prices can differ not only between the states but also within a state uh, and that is uh, what we have seen for a number of uh, states uh, for some states the difference between rural and urban inflation is more than 2% so that is uh, that is uh, uh, that needs to be understood what what is causing so much deviation uh, for a particular state between rural and urban general trend has been that rural inflation is more than urban inflation as i mentioned for most of the states but there are some states like delhi Himachal Pradesh, uh, Punjab, where uh, it's the other way around. So urban inflation is more. So it's very important to have a disaggregated uh, view of uh, states' inflation, which are the states who, which have uh, whose inflation is above the national average. So 5.9 percent. So which are the states which are even above the 6 percent threshold, right. uh, and whether their their inflation has declined or is it going up? That gives a lot of uh, uh, guidance and uh, insight. sites about the policies in those states maybe msp is a problem supply side is a problem there could be various reasons so this is something definitely that the government should look at but do you feel that then the rbi also when it's targeting inflation it shouldn't be looking only at a national number it should look region wise there is there should be at least looking at maybe they are targeting one number but they should take cognizance of the uh, variation in states uh, particularly in for example what i we just talked about spices inflation has certainly it, it has it has been rising but it has picked up and within uh, food inflation we have very interesting uh, finding that rajasthan has features as a state which has the highest food inflation so what is the reason is it something state specific or what is the reason that needs to be at least discussed and uh, taken into cognizance when uh, the mpc is making its decision because they do talk about food inflation so maybe there is a merit in also looking at state level variations in food inflation right and now we have a question from one of our viewers which is that the rbi has had to write a letter to the government regarding you know why inflation has been above 6% for so long and it's had to give explanations and also what the future outlook is the question is what are the findings of this report and this letter that they've given and whether it'll be made public this is something that i can answer for you uh the report is not going to be made public the government has made this very clear and so we don't know what reasons the rbi has given and what its outlook is for the future now unless this report is leaked somehow there's no way that we'll find out because it's privileged information so that is your answer right there but there's another question that we have which is that it's more procedural how do they go about you know measuring inflation and assigning the baskets you've talked a little bit about the survey but now when they have to look at the prices across the country across the states do they send a the person out to each of these yes so uh, from the ministry some persons are assigned and uh, they go and visit the market and take quotation from the uh, those designated uh, markets and within those markets also there are some designated shops from which the prices are uh, collected now if you remember during covid time because of the national lockdown there were some months when uh, 
the data could not be collected. Right. So for some uh, months, uh, April, May, June, we did not have the inflation data. And for some commodities, the inflation data was imputed. And uh, therefore, that is not the correct measure. So it's very important, this survey, this going to the markets, collecting information about prices, from the designated markets and shop is a very integral part of the entire uh, uh, collection uh, price collection mechanism. So once the prices are collected and then we have the weights based on the weights and the prices, the index number, the CPI index is uh, determined. Right. And now you've been tracking the economy and all of this data for quite a long time. Do you feel confident that this data collection process is robust? Yes, the, because you know we have the 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 methodology is quite well documented. So if we look at the uh, CPI manual, which is released by Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. Every detail about, even the minutest detail about uh, the information collection procedure is given. And when we come to the uh, data also, even the state level data is released periodically. So I don't uh, think that there is any problem with the uh, collection. It's that the, the same methodology is conducted every month to collect prices and that methodology is well documented. So. There is little scope for any uh, problem in the data per se. So the inflation data that is being collected is robust, but there's a huge discrepancy across the country. Different states have different inflation rates within a state. The inflation rate between urban and rural varies greatly. And within that, the inflation for various items might vary greatly where your veggie prices might be like kind of easing off now cereal prices are going up right now we see spices yes. the inflation is going up so the data that you get at the end of the or on the 12th of the month each time that inflation is a certain number yes. that's just a general number it doesn't fully reflect what's happening across the country and it might not fully reflect what's happening in your market but it gives policymakers a direction to look at and to know that you know oh it's higher this time versus last month or it's lower this time so that's what the inflation number means to you thank you so much for joining us this was your episode of macro sutra please join us next week